Welcome to the Roto World Basketball Show. We are back post All Star break with a lot to cover. I am Vaughn Delzell, joined alongside Dan Titus of Yahoo Sports and Raphael Johnson of NBC Sports. It's good to see both you, gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed your few days of less work with the All Star break, giving you guys a little bit of a breather. Uh, Dan, I'll start with you, man. Any takeaways from the weekend, and how was your weekend? Uh, my weekend was great, man. I got the opportunity to uh, to get on the media side of All Star Weekend. It was my first time actually covering it, and uh, it was bananas, man. Like I I've never been in, in an environment where everything was just like a mass frenzy, um, but it was cool, man. I I got a, some really good interviews. Got to talk to a lot of the rising stars, which I think was dope, um, especially around this time of fantasy basketball when you're going to start to see the rookies play a little bit more. It was good to kind of get a little um, a little foresight into what their opportunity might look like, what they've learned and stuff like that. But other than that, man, it was, it was a good weekend. A lot of discourse on how shitty the all-star weekend was, but like I had a good time overall. Well, first off, congratulations for doing that for the first time. I want to ask you then who was your favorite person you interviewed and who was the coolest person that you met? Um, Favorite interview was probably Vince Williams jr. He, me and him, like not a lot of people were talking to him. So I got to talk to him, like just ask him random stuff, like his favorite rapper, what he does when he's not traveling. This is a very open book and he's talking a lot. So I really appreciated him. Um, the coolest person that I met, um, probably, probably Mike Epps. I, I got to talk to him for a little bit and I made a joke about him squashing the beef with Shannon Sharp there mm -hmm. at one of the spots around Indianapolis. So I thought that that was kind of cool. He kind of leaned into it like he wasn't a dick about it. So, um, yeah, I'd probably say Mike Epps. Yeah, that's sweet. Mike Epps is definitely a legend. And uh, Vince Williams, friend of the show, obviously. We talk about him a lot. Uh, he definitely has done us justice. So, Raphael, how was your weekend, man? Do you have any cool stories to tell? No. Um yeah, it was That's just a sleep. few days of yeah, a few <laughs> days of less work, so, you know, get some rest. Um, still a few things to take care of, but all in all, it was a good good opportunity to kind of step away. And now we kind of dive straight into a stretch run with like twelve games on Thursday, and then another, I think ten or eleven on Friday, if I'm not mistaken. So mm -hmm. yeah, if you're, you're playing fantasy, you better be up on your uh, on your lineups. So make sure they're all set and ready to go. Yeah, and that's why we are here. We got a lot to cover today, uh, definitely with injuries, guys worth holding, trading, um, and pickups for the big slates on Thursday and Friday. But first, uh, Rafael, I'll start with you. Uh, what did you like about the NBR's All-Star Weekend? What were your main takeaways? Is there anything that you would like to fix or any ideas? Um, I think I was kind of taken aback by the anger over – the lack of competitiveness in the all-star game because it's pretty much been that way yeah, for a very too. long time now you know it's like it is what it is uh with the game i think it took what 168 combined three pointers um you know the game the game is the game i guess the lack of a better way to put it um it'll be interesting to see what changes they make but i just found it funny that there is an, an anger about a lack of competitiveness when once again, even though the league said they would change things up to not upset guys like pregame routines, they still had things set up that really upset their pregame routines. Like, I don't know if they told you in Indy what the start time was going to be for the game, <laughs> but I assumed it would be a little after 8 p.m. Eastern. And it was closer to like 840. And they had to warm up again after the Canadian and American national anthems. So it's like, if you're going to look at this as an entertainment spectacle, how upset can you be when the players treat it as such? So I think that's something, instead of just paying lip service to, the league really needs to get in front of this for future years and actually do something about it so that when you say a game's going to start at a certain time and guys are ramping up to that point, you started at that time. Yeah, I don't necessarily think there's a, a dollar amount that would get these guys motivated enough for all these players to play hard through an all-star game. But I think the main objective that Adam Silver and company want to accomplish is to have it close in the fourth quarter down this stretch. They want it competitive to where guys are actually playing somewhat defense scoring. And I thought maybe when they had the total set where you had to score a certain amount, that was the only way that get these guys competitive yeah. enough. I think the, the money is – is way out of here by now. Like they, they make yeah. so much money in their contracts that once they get the incentive for actually making an all-star team, 
that really doesn't matter. Like, yeah, bring back the Elam ending um, for one. It was funny. Some of the people were upset about how it was used last year. We're arguing that it should be brought back after this year's game. Which one of you guys want? You know, I just want, <laughs> want it back. But, yeah, I think the money part, there are no more financial incentives you can add when guys are already making eight figures annually in most cases. Yeah, I think the NBA All-Star game being competitive may be a lost cause. And all across major sports, the All-Star yeah. games are pretty much like that now because we've seen how many injuries can impact players. Uh, and their money moving forward, especially with all the money out there today. Uh, I definitely have some ideas for the slam dunk contest. But, Dan, I would love to hear, since you saw all this up close and personal, what were your takeaways from the dunk contest, three-point three, three point all-star game? Uh, were there anything that you think could be fixed or improved upon? Yeah, I think Jalen Williams had a really good suggestion, and I think it's been brought up in the past. But I think they need to have a one-on-one -on -one tournament. I think that would be a really interesting wrinkle to add to Saturday night. Another suggestion that I saw that I thought was that made a lot of sense was when we were younger, the all-star game was played in the middle of the day. And like, I think one of the problems with having these, all these theatrics and things to do for these players, like they're having to do so many obligations outside of actually playing the game that they're mm -hmm. actually tired and don't want to play the game. So move it up in the schedule, do have them do less. And I think maybe you'll get a better product or at least a little bit more competitive product. Um, but yeah, I'd say overall, man, like I feel like there's the hardest thing to change is really the dunk contest because like I don't they tried their best to get a superstar to do something there with the judges. And <laughs> Jalen Brown's performance was probably one of the worst I've seen. Judges like Obi Toppin man. had or Jacob Toppin had the best dunk in the in, in the, that wasn't the guy that went <laughs> to, the, to the finals. So, you know, I don't, I don't think money is Raf to Raf's point. I don't think money is going to change the motivation for these superstars to want to play in a dunk contest. So I don't know what you do at this point. Like, I'd almost rather see bring up the G-Leaguers and let them do it. Give them the, all the opportunity to go with Mac McClung because I've seen the G-League dunk contests are consistently better than the NBA's product. So you might as well just lean in. I don't need to see the NBA Hoopers do it anymore because clearly they don't want to. Um, mm -hmm. But other than that, man, I would say, I don't know. What do you expect? You know, it's the all-star game. Pro Bowl sucks. NBA all-star weekend has been a diminishing product too. It just is what it is. So take it for what it is at face value. Enjoy it. Have the time off. I, I don't know that how much you can do to really improve the product at this point. And I'll say the the between the two products too. I've uh, I've catch myself continually tuning into NBA All Star Weekend and uh, three point contest, all that. The Pro Bowl that's that's not on my radar. I mean, I haven't watched that you know six seven years now, and I don't plan on changing that because nothing will change that. But as far as basketball, you always expect like. Damian Lillard pulling it from half court, hitting threes consistently. It's fun to watch. We like we would have liked to see some more dunks, I think, in the all-star game. There's usually a lot of, you know, classics and uh, a lot of alley-oops and things like that. But you got Luka Doncic getting rim stuffed, uh, for example. That's more memorable than almost any other dunks in the in the uh, all-star game. But I, I thought of a fun idea, and I wanted to run it by you guys because I think the slam dunk contest and just dunking in – and period has reached the epitome of their tip top of what we can do as humans. Right. I mean, how many more spins cradles, uh, how high are we going to jump before this is, you know, we've seen it all already. So what I thought is, why don't we introduce the most exciting part of dunking to the slam dunk contest posters. That's and what the tournament does. Yes. <laughs> slam dunk yeah. and block party. Okay. And I think it's really simple when you break it down because you can have it seated eight players. Now we could go with the current format of what we had this year with McClung, Brown, Hawkes, and Toppin, but I'd rather not, uh, you know, in an ideal world, if we had to pick the dunkers and blockers, uh, I did that for us. I slated Giannis, Anthony Edwards, Zion, and Aaron Gordon Four dunkers, I think would be very fire to watch in an NBA slam dunk contest. As far as the four blockers, Victor Wembanyama, Anthony Davis, Rudy Gobert, Jaron Jackson. Very easy to see those guys. You just go by blocks per game. I think that's pretty fair, Raphael. Uh, so, yeah, I don't think the blockers would go for it because I think they would want their opportunity to dunk. Like the, the, and like that's what the thing. you mentioned. There will be. Okay, all right. Because like what the tournament does, the the winner take all tournament they do in the summer. For their dunk contest, if you're dunking, you also have to defend. So 
it's kind of if you get dunked on, you get your chance at some get back, you know, to throw down a, a theatric dunk on somebody. You know, so I think that would happen, but I just feel like I don't know, man. These guys, they really don't have anything to gain. I think that would be the difference because they're, they're already, they don't want to get embarrassed like that, you know, get yeah. put on a poster. Way too much ego to be yeah, able to yeah. put on a poster right now. Yeah. So I, I like the idea. I just don't think that they would go for it. Like that would also be my issue with King of the Court. I, I think there are a few guys who would do it like no hesitation, like Kevin Durant. Right. I think I could see him putting his hand up yeah. for that immediately. But a lot of those dudes, are like, nah, man, I don't want to do that because I may get exposed. You know, I don't want to be yeah, subjected I mean, to the Twitter trolls. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's not like I would say Rudy Gobert is going to be like, I want to partake in this uh, yeah. right off the bat. <laughs> Rudy Gobert but, going once would be an experience. Yes, yeah, so, he will be like, lining up to see to dunk on Rudy, though. Exactly. Uh, so, you know, there might be incentives for some players, for sure, to like, oh, yeah, I hate this guy or I want to get this guy. Uh, and I, I think that could be a situation where some guys want to hop in it. But, you know, as far as – the blockers not getting a chance to, I think the first round when you match those guys up one through eight seeds, uh, the first round is blocks and dunks. They advance mm -hmm. in the next round because you'd probably have a, a, a situation where maybe Gobert and Victor Wembanyama uh, block Giannis and Zion, for example, you know, and they win their round. So now it's two blockers. Well, they okay. got to go against each other. You can even do fun things like implement a money ball situation where those, whoever wins that situation, dunk or block, that's two points and a best of three. So you can even bring in the three-point contest. So I think there's a lot of ways to really fix the NBA dunk contest. It's just how do you get the better players to do it for the casual fans? Because last year, people didn't know about Mac McClung until the betting odds were released. And they were like, why is this guy a huge favorite <laughs> compared yeah, to all right. the other guys who we know? Uh, and this year, you know, Jaime Hawkes, as much as we might love him, he's not a common guy in a household. Jacob mm -hmm. Toppin's not a guy many people want to go out and see. No offense to him, even though he's a great dunker. Uh, so we need to do better in that retrospect, which I agree. But as far as fixing the dunk contest, plenty of ways to do that. I just think the talent uh, needs to also agree upon what needs to be done. So uh, any any thoughts on that, uh, Dan or Rafael? Um, no, I think you need to be put on the competition committee to figure this yeah. out because you got some good ideas. I mean, I think we can do a mixture of, of both things. Um, yeah, I feel like the three point was probably the best success. Like, I think at this point, the way Sabrina yeah. shot that thing, man, mm -hmm. she could compete against some of the other NBA pros. Like, bring her back in here. Um, I, I could do away with the starry shots. I'm still not into that, skewing all of the 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 the, the records of history. But um, I don't. I, I like the idea, man. I, I think bring it, bring out the petty. I think if we can get some some NBA players to actually have an opportunity to dunk on each other, that could be pretty fun. I mean, I'm just – I don't want to see Kai Sanat. Like, why are we dunking over him? You know, that's not – Right. Dude, he's so exciting. Like, what are we even doing? Yeah. yeah. And then, like, Kami Hawk is getting shacked. Like, oh, I mean, yeah, it's cool. It's a shout-out to Miami Heat legend and all that. But, like, that has been done already. And we keep – like, mm -hmm. you can't just interchange a YouTuber, a former athlete, a musician, and have us think that this dunk is far better than what it actually is. We've seen this how many times. So we live in the social media age. Let's not care yeah. ourselves. We got some 20 year olds over in other countries doing the same dunks. Uh, yeah. Raphael. Can we just stop blaming LeBron for the death of the dunk contest? Like, seriously, excuse <laughs> my language, but it's like the laziest shit I ever heard, man. It's LeBron. He's, he's 39 years old. You're still blaming him for the, the supposed death of the dunk contest? Like, come on, man. No. Because I think when that happens, you get stars like I may do it when they know damn well they're not going to do it. So if we stop blaming him, maybe other guys would just stop kind of like the false raising of their hands that they're going to do it. And just when we get to January, February, whenever they want to announce the contestants, just get four guys and go. Because I'm I'm just tired of the lazy blaming of LeBron for the the death of a contest where like for the most part people have reached their human limit. There's only so yeah. much more you can do just jumping off of a, a hardwood floor to dunk on a 10-foot rim. I mean, if you like to get – I don't know if steroids are going to help you, so you're pretty much <laughs> –
And you don't want anybody to do that, you know, to be clear. Don't, don't go out there and take steroids because you think you can dunk a little bit better. But, yeah, it is what it is at this point. Just, let's just stop lazily blaming people and things and just try to get down to, like, the real solutions or, or ideas here. Yeah. And, I, I mean, all across my timeline this past few days have been people talking about these situations but not offering any solutions to the situations. Yeah. And uh, I think we are far beyond that and tired of that in a lot of ways. But uh, I'm with you. Someone watching this right now is screaming out, LeBron is a liar. Uh, because, yeah, they, 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 they just can't take him. It's his fault for everything yeah. wrong in the NBA. Uh, and before we get into all the fantasy additions and ads to help you guys out for the second half of the season, uh, we should comment on LeBron's uh, retirement tour uh, as he spoke on because he doesn't know how long he's going. Uh, but are, is there ever – have been an NBA player that is going to sulk in a retirement tour like LeBron James. Let's not kid ourselves. Am I right? Bro, If there's no doubt that he's going to soak all that up. And, bro, it's going to be the most dramatic thing since, I don't know, the last time. Maybe Kobe was – I feel like Kobe was deserving just because, like, I feel like he had a – Sure. He had a different type of career than LeBron, whereas LeBron's always been freaking, you know – the poster boy and oh, never did wrong. You know what I'm saying? Like, and he's also like the most egotistical probably athlete that we have probably. So yeah, of course he's going to want his little farewell tour and mm. he deserves it. I'm not going to lie. He does, but will I be in the attendance? Probably not. I mean, God. <laughs> that's, that's going to be uh yeah. The attendance it's going to be so one. drawn out. Yeah, he's going to film a whole documentary for it. Like it, it's going to be the next last dance. I can already see it. Please. I mean, the money on that one is going to be ridiculous. Uh, Rafael, are you in agreement? There will be a farewell tour. Um, yeah. You know, I, I don't mind it, you know, given what he's accomplished. You know, whatever. It, it'd be cool. Um, but I don't know. I think, if anything, I'm kind of more interested in certain cities. Like, Obviously, he's going to get a great reception in Cleveland. I think Miami would be a good one as well. But what happens when he goes to San Francisco? I think that would be something to kind of – that would be interesting given the battles that he had against – he's had against the Warriors throughout his career. That would be one. Um I can't really think of any great ones in Boston. Yeah, that's another one from his time in Cleveland and Miami. So I think those two cities in terms of places where he didn't play as a home team player – It'll be interesting to watch in terms of how he's received you know, during, whenever he decides to hang him up. Yeah, I think that he will get the respect he gets deserves from some most franchises, if not all franchises. Yeah. Even one that I thought of uh, slightly, why people may not think about them right now, is the Detroit Pistons. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, LeBron had some had some real battles with them when he was young, yeah. uh, and you know the the battles throughout. He's had some numbers, so. Uh, yeah, I think it would be well deserving and, and exciting to see. But uh, at you know, 39 years old, he's still doing 40 point triple doubles. Uh, may take him a few overtimes, uh, mm -hmm. but he's doing that against the Warriors and such. So yeah, he's a great player. I'm excited to see how he does go out. But we all know he's playing with his son first, so um, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> so where, where should we start? Probably uh, the other Vaughn, Jock Vaughn, getting fired, uh, yeah. Brooklyn Nets. What do you think about that, Raphael? Where are we going from here with Brooklyn? Um, I don't really know if it – it's really tough to evaluate in terms of how this impacts fantasy just because the person who's replacing him, Kevin Ollie, we know about his college resume, won a national title at UConn, but this is his first head coaching job in the NBA. Um, interim, interim basis, obviously. I think if anything, I'm watching Mikhail Bridges in terms of how he's used um, – he should be the, the focal point. I don't know if he's going to be that type of player for a contending team if they get to that point. But right now, I think he should be the focal point. Kind of want to see what happens with Ben Simmons in terms of his health. How are they going to have to manage his minutes? And also Cam Thomas. He's another one. We saw him come out scalding hot to begin the season, but the inefficiency and then the defensive issues kind of led to him dropping to the bench. He's back in the starting lineup. So I think those are the three guys. I'm kind of watching right now in terms of how their how their fantasy values are impacted with the coaching change. I don't think anything really changes for Nick Claxton, but I think Bridges, uh, Simmons, and Thomas are the three I would be I would have my eye on these first few games out of the break. 
Yeah, right now the Brooklyn Nets are sitting in the 11th spot then in the Eastern Conference, two and a half games back of the Hawks. Uh, like Rafael said, there's a few options on the fantasy market. What are you expecting from this team for the second half of the season? Are they making a push or not? Um, I think that the locker room kind of fell out of favor with, with Jacques Vaughn. I thought they probably waited too long to fire him, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think from everything that I've read about Jacques, about Kevin Ollie and what he's telling his team about, you know, pressing the reset button, focusing on the rest of the season, they still do have a shot at getting into that playing tournament. That sounds like the goal. I heard Mikel Bridges cursing at the presser, which is not something that he usually does. So obviously he's tired of losing. Um, and it sounds like they're going to be given minutes to the players that show the most effort. Usually that doesn't involve Ben Simmons, if I'm, mm -hmm. if I'm being honest. So I, I'd actually be more interested in someone like Dennis Schroeder, who came over at the deadline. He had a couple of good games and he kind of fizzled out in a couple other ones. But I think he's a guy that I think could earn minutes if Ben Simmons stumbles or doesn't show the effort that he needs. And the other player that Raph brought up that I think was a good point was Cam Thomas, who doesn't really do much outside of scoring. So if he's off a few nights, who knows? This dude could be benched, in which case I think that would also open up more minutes for someone like Dennis Schroeder. So um, I think Nick, the, the main guys are pretty safe. Um, I would love to see more out of Cam Johnson. He's been pretty much a disappointment this year. But, you know, now that this team might have a revisioned or re recalibrated focus with a different voice in the room, they could play better. So if you do have some of the mainstay guys, you hold them. Uh, but I wouldn't be relying on someone like Ben Simmons at this state at this stage in the game, knowing that they're vying for this final playing spot and he hasn't really been reliable all year. Yeah, I mean, we've seen two more commonly in sports over the years that when a coach gets fired, that team kind of gets an injection of energy uh, yeah. for the few first few games or weeks. Um, and I mean, if you're a college basketball fan, you just saw Ohio State beat Purdue after doing that, so it can happen. And I do expect the Nets to play a little better, but it's pretty crazy, guys, to see them just two, three seasons removed from having Durant, Irving, James Harden, LaMarcus Aldridge, Bruce Brown, uh, you know, all these type of guys, DeAndre Jordan, Blake Griffin. Uh, so that team has had a lot of turnover in the past few years, and I expect that to continue into this offseason as well. Uh, maybe not the case, though, for the Golden State Warriors, who starting to get a little bit better. Clay Thompson off the bench, scored 35 points. That was pretty wild. Did not expect that, but Brandon Pozinski now steps in as a starter for the Warriors, Raphael. So uh, what's the value on those two players? I think Pozinski receives a boost uh, as a starter because it's quite clear that not just the coaches, but his teammates are trusting him. Um, he, he's a good player in terms of his all-around ability. I'm not expecting like top 75 value or something to that effect, but I think he can hover around that top 100 area, to be honest with you. Um, as for Clay, I, I'm taking a wait and see approach. Um, you know, he played well in that first game off the bench. If he can get high 20s to low 30s in minutes still, I think he can be okay as like a primary scorer for that second unit. But it's all about buy-in with him. I think that's going to be the key for him moving forward. Uh, it's It was interesting hearing him after the game. It's like, well, my minutes are still going to be high. It's like, all right, it, that's good. But I kind of feel like there's like an, a, a part that you have to kind of earn that. And not to say that he hasn't, but it's almost like in order for him to buy in, he had to know that the minutes were going to be there regardless. So I would take a wait and see approach with him right now. But that was a very good first impression with him coming off the bench. Yeah, definitely. That's a wise answer on Clay Thompson. I feel like he is the type of player that in the final stage of his career, he'll buy and accept that role, especially if it means winning or competing for a championship. And he doesn't have that type of ego that'll hold him back. And for Pozemski, Dan, I mean, this is a big opportunity for him. He gets to play in the starting role on the Warriors at the end of this legacy run for them. So do uh, you agree it's a big step up in fantasy value for him? Yeah, I think he's a he's a good real life player, and I think we can already see that as as seen by him leading the league and drawn charges charges drawn. Um, he's I read something over the weekend that you know he challenged Draymond Green in a scrimmage at the very beginning of the season. So like clearly this is a voice in the room of someone that they think is playing above his age and his expectation. And I think the move to moving. But Jemski into the starting lineup is only going to help his fantasy value. Like he's a guy that can get you rebounds and assists, score 10 points a game. He can hit a couple threes. Still worry about the efficiency a little bit. But so I agree with Raph. I don't know if we're talking 
you know, anything beyond a top 100 player here, but that's still someone that needs to be rostered in all leagues. Um, as it comes for clay, as it goes to clay, I feel like him moving to the bench is probably a good thing. Um, probably can be less in his head. I, I don't think that he's probably realized now that that contract is not coming. So the best thing that he can do is just do what he does best and that shoot and him playing with that second unit. He should play better um, playing on that playing against second tiered guys on that second unit. So I don't, I don't expect a 35 point output every game, but you know, I think we could definitely be looking at 20 plus points off the bench and uh, he's always a good help for threes and, and, um, and points. So, you know, Clay at this stage in his career is mostly that just a bucket, but I think he's still worthwhile holding on to as we see how he kind of ad adapts to this new role off the bench. But I think it's going to be good for the Warriors as they make their their little push here to get out of that playing spot. Yeah, I think this could only be a positive situation for the Warriors. They're sitting in the uh, tenth spot in the West, twenty seven and twenty six. So you certainly want to finish over five hundred for the season. And it probably wasn't fun for Warriors fans or the team whenever. Charles Berkeley told uh, Draymond, good luck uh, in the playing tournament this year. Uh, <laughs> but it's where the Warriors are headed, unless uh, they can make things change, and that's what they're trying to do here. Uh, for the New York Knicks, though, Rafael, your squad's looking pretty good. They and the Cavaliers were two of the hottest teams in the NBA heading into the All-Star break. 11 games, over 500. Did you think we'd be here? Um. I thought they'd be good. Uh, you know, obviously they came back to earth a little bit, but that was – injury based for the most part. So you understood why they went, they limped into the all-star break, but Dante DiVincenzo, Isaiah Hartenstein and Bojan Bogdanovic all practiced on Tuesday, uh, which bodes well for their availability on Thursday uh, against the 76ers. I think the one that would concern me the most would be DiVincenzo because you're dealing with a hamstring. Um, obviously Hartenstein as well, but hamstring injuries we've seen, those can be really tricky. In terms of guys coming back too soon, they wind up on the shelf for another two to three weeks. So he had been outstanding before that injury in terms of the productivity. I think everyone will be fine in terms of the guys who are currently healthy. Like Josh Hart's going to remain a starter. Um, Precious Achua, his starting spot depends on OG Ananobi, who's still out. So I think he's going to be fine. You know, it, I don't really know if there's going to be anyone to pick up you know, outside of the guys who are already rostered at this point, to be honest with you. Yeah, DiVincenzo, too. Is he a very athletic guard, man? So he's going to need that hamstring the way that he plays. But, yeah, a lot of injury situation going on for the Knicks. I feel like when they do get healthy, they're going to be a team to uh, be reckoned with. Dan, what's what's your opinions? Are there any guys worth watching, too, or do you agree with Raphael right now? It's just kind of set in stone with what you have. Um, my, my take on the Knicks is that I'm concerned about OG Ananobi. If you have him stashed somewhere, there's been no progress as to how he's doing with his, his injury. So I would actually be looking to sell him if you could, he wasn't very particularly good before that anyway. Um, and now that you have all these mouths to feed with Bojan Bogdanovich coming in, Alec Burks is getting minutes off the bench. Josh Hart still needs to get his, his, his minutes. Um, it's just kind of, it's kind of seems like it's getting kind of, jammed and with him being hurt he was probably going to take like a minutes restriction when he comes back get involved like it's going to take time when you don't have that much time in fantasy basketball like the fantasy playoffs start in four weeks in standard yahoo league so um i would actually be looking to offload him and as well as isaiah hartenstein like this dude was a league winner like i have him in literally every team that i have but i'm concerned about that achilles injury man like he re-aggravated it pretty easily and you know yeah he got a week to rest off of it but like who knows julius randall is going to be coming back soon precious achua is playing well you don't really need to put that much load on him if you guys are looking at a, a serious playoff run here and they're going to need him so um he's actually one of the players that i actually think that you could sell right now that still has some production value that still might be intriguing for anyone looking for a big man but i, I just don't know that i trust his health right now and I also could say you could you could say the same for Dante DiVincenzo with that hamstring injury. He's been playing outstanding this year, but is he a top 50 player? You could probably get some serious value for someone like that right now, especially because they're hurt. So, yeah, my, those are my concerns. Are the Knicks good? Yes. Will they get better? Absolutely. They're definitely a team that could be reckoned with come playoff time. But if we're talking fantasy playoffs, I think you need to temper expectations a bit on some of these guys that are hurt right now. 
That's great advice. With four to five weeks to go in the season until the playoffs, uh, some of these guys may not be giving you the production you need. And a few weeks after that, as the Knicks make the playoff runs, those guys could be doing great. Rafael? I've got to roll the dice. If you, have Mitchell Rob- if you have Mitchell Robinson stashed, I would hold him because I kind of feel like if he can get back mid-March, you know, he's someone that he may not need, he may not need too many minutes to help you in the rebounds and blocks categories. So especially with the Hartenstein point that, that Dan made, if he suffers some sort of like issue with that Achilles down the line and Mitchell is relatively healthy, you get a good 20, 25 minutes per game from him during fantasy playoff time. He could be a bit more useful than we anticipated when that injury, that ankle injury initially happened. Get you them stocks too. Maybe hit a triple or so. Uh, oh, hell yeah, no. Mitch Robinson. <laughs> Mitch, no. Uh, don't nobody want to see that. Sorry, yeah. he'll attempt a triple or two. No, I I don't even think he'll do that. He he knows he knows where his bread is buttered. We'll say that about Mitch. <laughs> He's learned his lesson. I love that. Uh, that's that's hilarious. There. All right, we'll stash Mitchell Robinson. We'll buy in. Uh, Raphael's been on a little heater this year with his big men. So uh, Mitchell Robinson is the next one we'll be covering here. Uh, before we hit the quick break, though, Chicago Bulls. Uh, Patrick Williams still dealing with a foot injury. Torrey Craig got a sprained knee. So they're going to be without these guys for a few weeks. Uh, concerning or not, Dan, for Chicago, I'm not concerned because this is just what we're used to. I mean, I feel like this is a great look for Ayo Um, You know, right now he's playing – more of the shooting guard, but also playing that small forward spot. Everyone's kind of going to get a bump up here, but I, I really feel like that's the guy that you can get that's still widely available in fantasy leagues. And, you know, I think that he's quietly just had like a really solid season. He's efficient from the field. He can get you stocks. Um, he has these little scoring out bursts, but then also can give you some rebounding. Not much for the assists, but I feel like now this is just given more opportunity for him, especially with Torrey Craig now missing upwards of two to four weeks now with an injury, like all these injuries going with Chicago is really just going to benefit um, people like Ayo DeSumo, Alex Caruso uh, will also probably get a little bit of a bump there. So I think I, I saw Donovan say that he's going to be playing some power forward, which is crazy. Um, but that's just how bad it is yeah. now. And then also I would throw out Andre Drummond. Like this yeah. is going to be a big lineup that's going to continue. And I've seen Andre Drummond on a lot of waiver wires. He's a double, double guy and, and he can get you a couple blocks. So <laughs> if anything, I think that this is actually a pretty good opportunity for players who wouldn't normally roster that actually might have some some um, production value going forward here, at least for the, the next few weeks. Alex Caruso, power forward, Andre Drummond at center for the second unit. Man, <laughs> let's go. They're let's down to go. scraps, man. They're down to scraps. So, like, at this point, you got to take advantage of it. Well, um, the one thing I do not even for playoff stashing. Like, I think this is just – you got to play the injury game right now, man, yeah. uh, before it gets to silly season. Two, two notes, Raphael, as I'll toss to you, because uh, I think the growth of Ayo DeSumo next to Kobe White, Kobe White now the second odds favorite to be a uh, most improved player behind Tyrese Maxey. I think those two have been very dynamic together. Uh, but the one thing I've hated as a Chicago Bulls fan is Alex Caruso guarding the six foot nine, six foot ten best scorers on the other team, the Scotty Barnes, the Giannis's. What are we doing here? Uh, but they're going to continue to do that. So uh, what are your thoughts on Chicago and their fantasy options? Yeah, I agree with Dan. I think Io DeSumo is one of my like potential silly season breakout guys because he's going to have to play a lot. Um, he scored, he's reached double figures in scoring in each of his last eight starts and started eight of the last nine heading into the break. The exception being that win over Minnesota, where they started Andre Drummond next to Vucevic for obvious reasons, and it, and it worked. So both of those guys are going to play plenty. I think I wouldn't add Julian Phillips right now, but I think he's someone to kind of keep on your watch list for later in the season, uh, especially if the Bulls were to trend in the wrong direction. Like it doesn't take too much to see maybe them trending in the wrong direction and Brooklyn moving up because of that new head coach bump that you mentioned. And if that happens, you know, Julian Phillips, second round pick out of Tennessee, highly athletic swing man. We've seen him have flashes when he got minutes earlier this season. Maybe there's going to be a bit more of an incentive to get him time later in the season, even if they were a play-in team, because 9-10, it really doesn't make that much of a difference. You know, so 
Yeah, I would like to see him get more run. You know, we'll see if that happens. I have a bit more faith in him than I do Dale and Terry, though. We're talking about those deep, deep roster guys. Yeah, Dale and Terry hasn't had the impact that Bulls fans thought he could have. Uh, yeah. But that also speaks to the growth of maybe an Ayo DeSumo or Kobe yeah. White, I think, that they played so well. But, yeah, it's not going to take much for the Bulls to fall out of the play-in spot. They are four and a half games up on the Nets um, and seven games up on the Raptors. But two teams like that could probably make a second half run there. And uh, the Bulls, still a young team in a lot of ways. Uh, but silly season is upon us, gentlemen. And so is spring training, if you didn't know. Uh, so the, for those looking to get ahead on the upcoming MLB season, go ahead and grab your Road World Baseball draft guide. It's loaded with comprehensive positional rankings, projections, and player profiles to ensure your draft is a success. Visit NBCSports.com backslash draft guide and use the code BASEBALL24 to get 10% at checkout. Baseball season's back already. I went to a Penguins game last night. That's hockey, but I'll be going to some Pirates games <laughs> this year because tickets are like 10 bucks because they are bad. Uh, so I wish I could get tickets for $10 to see LeBron James play, gentlemen, but uh, those are usually 200 every time I look. He might miss the game on Thursday against the Warriors. Uh, Dan, is there anybody you're looking at potentially picking up or streaming for this game on either side? No, um, and I, I wouldn't expect LeBron's absence to be particularly long, considering where they're at in the Western Conference right now. Um, you know, only a, a few games separates them from like the four seed, um, which is the Denver Nuggets right now. So, you know, they're going to have to make up some ground here and, and hit the ground running. And I think picking up Spencer Dinwiddie was a good port, a good part of that. Like, you know, they, they'd had to bolster that bench a little bit. Um, but I wouldn't expect LeBron to be out for more than probably just a game. And if they are, they're going to be in trouble. Yeah, I have to agree with that. They haven't, at least they've had Anthony Davis for the majority of this season, the rap. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's only missed what three games or four games. That's, that's probably the best yeah. he's had in about five or six seasons. Uh, so yeah. is there anyone that you're trying to stream for this game? Not really. I kind of feel like Rui Hachimura is kind of where he should be in terms of roster percentage. Like, I don't think that's going to change too much regardless of what happens with LeBron. So I mean, I'm sure a lot of people still have Spencer Dinwiddie based on the fact that he was a starter in Brooklyn. I've never been a big believer in him fantasy wise, to be honest with you. So, you know, no LeBron could potentially give him a boost, but I'm not expecting too much there. Yeah, totally agreed. So I think uh, we'll just enjoy that game and hope LeBron James does play, but Maybe you guys may have a, a look or two on the team next because the Suns are three, three and a half games up uh, on the Lakers. And Bradley Bill hasn't been much of the impact that we thought he would be in Phoenix. Uh, and he underwent a nose surgery, uh, underwent a nose procedure, I should say, during the break. Rafael, uh, any concern there for him and anybody worth picking up in Phoenix? Um, I think there – if I'm not mistaken, there's a, either a hamstring or a quad injury mix in there as well that happened right before the break. Because he'd been playing with the broken nose for a while without it being reset. So hopefully the fact that he got that taken care of during the break means that he won't miss any game time because he's already missed plenty. Um, I guess if he yeah. does sit on Thursday, then you're looking at Eric Gordon as a streamer. But other than that, I think you've pretty much added everyone that you're going to need. I would keep an eye on Royce O'Neal, though, just because of how well he played in his first game with the team coming off the bench there. Got 30 minutes, too. So that's an encouraging sign for him as a potential fantasy option. So I think Eric Gordon, maybe Royce O'Neal, that's about it in Phoenix. Yeah, we know Phoenix needed bench depth, uh, and they definitely got mm -hmm. some of that with Royce O'Neal. 7-3 and three in their last 10 games, so. Trending in the right direction, Dan. What are you looking at? Yeah, I agree with Raph. I think if you're looking in shallow leagues, it's probably a Grayson Allen, you know, competitive leagues, Eric Gordon. Um, but it's really, you know, if you're going deep, deep leagues, I think Royce O'Neal, as, as Raph stated, is the guy that's that's probably going to benefit if Beal's injury keeps him out any longer. And I do like O'Neal's appeal with this roster, man. He's kind of a, a do-it-all kind of a guy. Like, he gets you stocks, he gets you assists, he can hit threes. Won't score a lot, but he does everything else. So um, it wouldn't surprise me if he had some fantasy relevancy at certain points um, as the season kind of winds down here, especially because Bradley Beal just can't stay healthy. Uh, it's just one thing after another uh, with him. So, um, yeah, I would, I would probably have Royce O'Neal on a watch list for sure. 
Yeah, I, uh, I'm interested to see what Phoenix does the second half of the season as far as what experts and odds say for them. They're expected to have a very strong second half and make a push. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious to see what happens in Phoenix, a team that I haven't had high hopes on all season. Uh, but one guy that has blown our expectations, I feel like, is Aaron Neesmith. He was limited on practice on Tuesday. Is there anybody worth targeting there, Rafael? No, he's been officially ruled out uh, for for their next game. Okay. So he won't be available. Maybe Ben Matherin. He's at 45% rostered, but he doesn't his, – his game really isn't fantasy friendly to me. Like, he doesn't get you much in terms of the defensive stats or the rebounds. Three-pointers as well. He's kind of limited in that regard. So I think if anything, especially – they're playing it as part of a 12 game night on Thursday. You're going to be looking at other teams to fill the void left by Neesmith, if anything. Yeah. Dan, do you agree with that? Um, no, I'm actually off of Ben now. I I, gra I grabbed him when, you know, the Buddy Heel trade went down and expecting something great. I thought maybe it was injuries that were hampering him. Clearly he's fine because he played all all star weekend, rising mm -hmm. stars challenge, skills challenge looked fine. I'm actually looking more towards Andrew Nemhard, and it's it's because I think he works better in the starter in the starting unit than Ben Matherin does. Like Ben Matherin, I think is a guy that's going to have to adjust to the fact that he's just Carlisle likes him off the bench. He is a guy yeah. that can take over the scoring load off the in the second unit, and Nemhard for whatever reason can guard. You know, he can guard multiple positions. He's played a lot of minutes the last several of games, and. Um, He's actually been top 90 over the last two weeks, averaging 10 points, five assists, one and a half steals. Of course, some of those games included being without Tyrese Halliburton. But I don't know, man. I think that, you know, the last at least the last week, Halliburton was there and he was still seeing 28 to 30 minutes. So I'd actually be more interested in him. And he's more widely available. He's available in like 90 percent of leagues. So mm -hmm. if you're talking deep league ads and short term fill ins, I think Andrew Nemhard might actually do something for fantasy managers for um, primarily assists, steals, and and maybe some points too. I like that look a lot. I think both guys are going to be very interesting streaming options, especially depending on how Tyrese Halliburton's managed down the stretch, if he's healthy for the rest of the season. They're a team that certainly needs him right now, 31 and 25, six spot, one game or half a game ahead of the Miami Heat and Magic for the play-in. So uh, it'll be intriguing to see how Indiana – plays down the stretch. And New Orleans is another team, too, that I'm very interested in. And they just announced that Tyson Daniels, Raphael, is going to be reevaluated after four weeks. Um, is there anybody in New Orleans that you're trying to pick up right now? Yeah, not really. I think Trey Murphy's already going to be rostered wherever he needs to be in terms of his fantasy value. And he'll still be coming off the bench. Like, this doesn't change anything with their starters. So I don't really expect too much there. Maybe we see a bit more of Jordan Hawkins. Um, he doesn't bring the defensive skill set that that Daniels does, but he does bring three-point shooting. So that would be something to watch. Maybe Najee Marshall receives a bump in his minutes as well, but I don't think you're going to be rushing out to add either of those guys right now. Yeah, probably not rushing, Dan, but I do like the Jordan Hawkins call. I mean, Dyson Daniels was playing 22 minutes per game. He started 15 out of 52 games. Uh, do you like Hawkins? Uh, yeah, I love his game. I just don't know that there's enough spots for him to actually yeah. get um, enough minutes for him to be, you know, useful in fantasy right now. I mean, skill set wise, yeah, he's if he gets the minutes, he's he's definitely a person you got to play. Um, I was actually surprised, Raph, you, you mentioned Trey Murphy. He's under 50 yeah. percent rostered right now, and okay. he hasn't been particularly good this year. But like he's a guy that I would expect to improve as the season mm -hmm. wears on. Like this dude was coming off a meniscus injury had to kind of get back into the rotation of things. Like he's a player that I think actually might be better as the season wears on. And I know we're going to talk about another uh, Pelicans player later, but um, I don't think Dyson Daniels injury does anything really yeah. in the short term for fantasy managers. If anything, I actually think it might give a little boost to Zion Williamson. Um, I think he actually might play a little bit more point guard now that most of that, that um, opportunity is going to be going to CJ McCollum and we know the offense can play through B.I. or Zion Williams. And so um, I actually wouldn't be surprised if Zion can stay healthy. We see a little uptick in assists now, too. Yeah, Zion, uh, an intriguing player down the stretch. Just like to see him healthy in general. But I do have yeah. a question to ask you guys about some Pelicans players on the other side of this break.
as Goldenhauer, as you guys can see, is hitting me right now. So hopefully I can read <laughs> this promo appropriately. Uh, fresh off setting the all-time women's scoring record. Caitlin Clark and Iowa hit the road for a top 15 matchup against Indiana on Thursday night. Watch another chapter in Clark's historic season at 7.30 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Peacock. That girl is a walking bucket. Uh, excited to watch that game for sure because Iowa basketball is up right now. They just beat Michigan State in men's ball last night too. Uh, but let's talk about some New Orleans Pelicans players. Uh, let's specifically, let's talk about Herb Jones. He's been a top 75 player all year in nine cat. Uh, are we buying that for the rest of the season, Rafael? Ooh, that's a good question. Well, not to toot my own horns, I wrote the question, but yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the delivery was good. Yeah. Was no, but um, yeah, I, you know, I actually think he can be because he's improved his perimeter shot. Uh, the defense is always going to be there. The minutes will be there. Um, and he's someone that with more point Zion minutes, I think he can benefit because you can't just guard a six foot seven, 285 pound bowling ball going downhill, initiating offense with one person. So I think someone's going to have to cheat and more often than not, you're going to cheat off of Herb Jones and either CJ McCollum or Brandon Ingram when talking about the starters. So I think he can maintain top 75 value for the remainder of the season. Has been excellent. 50 games played this year, 11 points, uh, 3.7 rebounds, 2.4 assists, and two combined stocks. Doesn't pop off the page, but it's consistent all around numbers. Uh, Dan, do you buy into what Herb can be? Um, I've been a little disappointed with Herb, to be honest. Like, I I think top 75 is fair for him for the rest of the season. I just I'm not excited by the counting stats that he that he produces outside of stocks. If he's not getting stocks, he kind of has these pretty unenthusiastic stat lines. So if you're playing in points leagues, I would probably avoid Herb Jones because he's not going to do enough for you to to be rosterable. But, you know, if we're talking his, his efficiency is definitely what's boosting his his nine cat rank. So I think top 75 is is definitely attainable. Um, kind of put him in that range of like Aaron Neesmith. Like I feel like he, he could perform around the same value as him the rest of the way. Do you know what's an obtainable goal for Herb Jones this season? A 50, 40, 90 season. That's what Herb Jones could accomplish. 49.7% mm -hmm. yeah. from the field, 40.7% from the three and 86% from the free throw line right now. So uh, not many people probably expected Herb Jones to go 50, 40, 90 splits this year, uh, an historic season for most players, but he could do that. Uh, so He's probably the most player. unlikely pers person yeah. to do it <laughs> if anyone <laughs> does this year. I, I actually didn't even realize it was that he was that close to it. That's crazy. Yeah, so that's probably what's bringing his value that high. Uh, so mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see how he breaks down. But another guy that's not shooting quite that efficiently uh, from three is Daniel Gafford. But he's providing great value so far. Third round value in nine cat according to Basketball Monster. Is he a hold? Or a sell spot for you, Raphael? I think I would hold. Um, and, and the reason why is that even with Derek Lively the second making his return, Gafford's always been a player that if he can get the 25 minutes, he will give you really good value. Even in this case, you, you may be looking at a 24-24 split. I think he would still bring you good value. High field goal percentage, um, the rebounds would be there, you know, the, the stocks would be there as well. So I, for me, he would be a hold, but I can understand if you can get like third round value in return, I would understand if some managers would entertain the possibility of, of making a move for the fantasy trade deadline. Yeah, 15 points and 12 rebounds uh, on average. That's the first three games with Dallas, uh, three games played, Dan. I mean, we, we like that move a lot when we broke it down. We said that it's going to be a huge addition to Dallas, who's trying to make the run one game behind New Orleans for their division. Uh, do you think he's a guy worth holding and playing down the stretch? Yeah, I, I don't think the question is asked. I don't think the question is whether Daniel Gafford's the hold. I think the question is whether Derek yeah. Lively is the hold, yeah. mainly because yeah. I think this is Daniel Gafford's job now. Like he's he played so well in the absence of Derek Lively that it's like, yo, you gotta you gotta start this guy because of what he can do on both sides of the ball. And to be honest, they have similar skill sets. They're both rim protectors, rim runners that can catch lobs both athletic 
Um, but I will say that I think I'm holding Derek Lively for the four C. I'm, I'm holding him for now just to kind of see how he does, because in his first game back, he had four blocks, eight rebounds and five rebounds. Not a lot, but I'll take those blocks all day. So I think this is going to be a timeshare. I think Gafford's going to have the lion's share of the timeshare, but we know what Gafford can do. And he never sees 30 minutes anyway. So mm-hmm. I think he's going to be more or less the same guy he was before, just he's playing with a better point guard and and talent in, in Dallas. So he should probably be better. Um, so, but I'm I'm with Raph in the thought though, if you're concerned about the timeshare, you could probably get significant value for Daniel Gafford after the way that he's looked in the first few games with Dallas. Like this is honestly a sell high moment, right? Mm-hmm. Like if, if you're going yeah. to do it, this is the time to do it. But I also understand if you want to hold him because he's been, he's going to be really good in this, in this uh, lineup. I totally agree. And 26 and a half minutes per game with Washington this year was a career high for him. We saw the ability to put up double doubles, but averaging 11 and eight points with them. And I, I've been a fan of him since he was with the bulls back in 2019 and got drafted because out of college, very athletic, good rim protector uh, could obviously catch lobs and dunk, but he's added some wrinkles to his game. Uh, he's not shooting the threes, but he's shooting 69, 61% this year with Washington and Dallas. And that's kind of what they want uh, with him around the rim. So I do agree. I think he is the guy that took the center job now. And Derek Lively Jr. is on the outside looking in. Uh, but silly season, Rafael, as you said, mm-hmm. is coming upon us and it's coming fast. Uh, is there anybody that you're looking at that could help your team either make a playoff run or potentially win a championship? Io DeSumi was one that I mentioned earlier. I think Keontae George in Utah is another one. Um, it's a great well, one. For thir- you, 33 points and nine three-pointers in that last game before the break against the Warriors. You're not expecting that kind of consistent production from him. The percentages have been a bit disappointing from him as a starter or in general. Um, but So that's going to be the one concern, but he's going to play plenty. You know, They moved him back into the starting lineup right after the trade deadline. So I don't see that changing anytime soon. So I think he's someone that fancy managers think he's rostering like 45% of Yahoo leagues or something to that effect. So he's someone that can be really effective come silly season time, I think. I love those two looks like guards. Keontae George has been a guy that uh, I've been very impressed with. Even last year in college, he was a guy that I thought has the ability to be a three-level scorer in the NBA, Dan. Uh, He gave us two guards. Do you have any guards for us? Are you going big man? Yeah, I, I love those calls, man. Um, I'm going to write a piece tomorrow um, about my projections for the the rest of the season. And Io and, and Keontae, George definitely landed on that list, um, especially Keontae. I had a chance to talk to him at, at the All-Star Weekend, and he was just saying how much uh, Chris Dunn and Jordan Clarkson have been doing for him to, you know, kind of get more used to playing the point guard position, evolving into that role. And I think this is going to be his job to lose going forward, um, especially if you look at the where you, the Utah Jazz are in the standings, I'm not expecting them to make this huge leap. So I think there's a very good chance we could see a lot of Keontae George down the stretch here. And as Raf said, I, I, I think you're going to struggle with the efficiency, but you know I think he could also give you a lot of points, assists, and steals um, as a rookie. But I'm going to talk about another rookie, Scoot Henderson. Mm-hmm. Um, Phillips already called him the starter for the rest of the season. That's whether Malcolm Brogdon comes back or not. I don't think that he will. Uh, no, he probably will, but I still know to what capacity, right? This Portland yeah. Trailblazers team is not going anywhere. Um, so I actually feel like Scoot Henderson has a chance to actually be a pretty good fantasy player. In the month of February, he's averaging 18 points, six assists. Um, he's going to struggle with his efficiency same way as Keontae George. But if you're talking about opportunity, I think he probably has a bigger opportunity because he has a lot less to work with here. DeAndre Ayton's probably going to mail it in at some point. He probably already has. Jeremy Grant, I mean, he's just a bucket, but he's probably going to mail it in. You're going to be seeing a completely look, different looking Portland Trailblazers roster by, you know, two, three weeks from now. And I think that's going to be spearheaded by Scoot Henderson. So I think his best days are ahead, man. And we were talking about him a while ago about a player that, you know, could really come on at the end of the season. I think you're starting to see that right now. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's I think it's about to be Scoot Henderson time. What's the availability on Jabari Walker right now in Portland? Is he someone that's over fifty percent rostered? No, he's probably like he's, he's probably like under twenty now. Um, which I'd be curious. Is he like, someone I that guess, we can consider? Yeah, I'll, I'll be probably 13. between him and thirteen. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd probably be between Reith, him yeah. and Jop Reith. 
I think. I, and I can't know. I don't know which one. Or which one are you guys mm-hmm. leaning towards? I lean Walker. I think he's been getting more opportunities to start. I believe that yeah. changed recently before the break when Tumani Kamara moved into the starting lineup. So yeah, he's another one. Mm-hmm. That I think. Yeah, I think team. Walker, Kamara, you know, those two. And then, yeah, I think if we're looking on the opposite end of the spectrum with regard to silly season, I think Aiton's a pretty easy choice to kind of fall off because yeah, I mean, you kind of know what you're going to get there in terms of, you know, not just his career, but also how he fits in Portland. Um, and we saw him play extremely well against Minnesota on Tuesday and then two nights later lay an absolute egg against the same team. So I don't know. I, yeah, I, I don't have an, I don't have much trouble seeing at some point where they just say, you know, we're just going to shut you down unless you have you go through like 28 minutes of glorified cardio and call that basketball. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. I was going to say, I think uh, Jabari Walker and Aiden is the most intriguing situation for fantasy because I feel like at some point they're going to shut him down, let mm-hmm. Walker play and start and get those 30 minutes. And he could be a guy that is going to be double doubling and be important in fantasy down the stretch. And uh, only the people who are really paying attention might be out head the curve on this one. So, Dan, I mean, Aiden's the obvious suspect for us to talk about player taking a hit the second half. But is there anyone from the last month of the season you're staying away from? Yeah, I'd be selling Jaron Jackson Jr. Um, I, I'm just concerned about Memphis's ability to get Desmond Bain back, Marcus Smart back. It doesn't sound it sounds like they're both progressing, but there's been no official timeline for either of their returns. And the further you get into the loss column, just the more concern I have about Jaron Jackson Jr. Like why play him, Um, especially when you've been handing out all these contracts to these two way guys and the G League guys like and they're winning games. So like, hey, let's Mm -hmm. go see more Gigi Jackson. Let's go see Santi Aldama. Like you don't you don't need Jaron Jackson out there. And to be honest, he hasn't really been that great anyway. He's scoring a lot of points, but he's not rebounding. His blocks are down. He gets you a steal. I would sell the name off of it alone and, and just try to get a better player that could play deep into the playoffs that because I don't, I don't think we're going to see Memphis really have anybody else out there. That's not, you know, an, uh, an unfamiliar name to most. You know, we're going to be seeing the Scottie Pippen juniors, the Vince Williams juniors. Like it's not going to be Jaron. Yeah, a lot of juniors on that team. Uh, but yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I was really love, like, Damn, that's a lot of juniors. Yeah, yeah that's, that's all that caught my attention there at the end. Uh, but no, I, I'm with you. I think Memphis is definitely a team that's going to be a uh, very, very looked upon for silly season here, along with Portland. Rafi, anyone to add before we pivot to the schedule? Maybe Kyle Kuzma. Um, you know, I think it, Washington's not going anywhere, anywhere fast. Um, and they kind of need to figure out a way to get more minutes for Bilal Koulibaly and his ability to play pretty much anywhere on the wing will help him for sure. His minutes have increased, you know, leading up into the all-star break. I think that'll be even more the case afterwards. So I think Kyle Kuzma would be someone else. It may not happen right away, but eventually I think I could see him, his minutes get tapered down a bit. Yeah, love that look. The Wizards are nine wins and 45 losses. Half a game or one game up on the Detroit Pistons now. Um, Funny how that transpired. So. Uh, I would say they are going nowhere fast as well. Can't decide who I want to put some money on to be the the worst record in the NBA because the bottom of the barrel is bad, uh, uh-huh. and the Wizards are certainly going to shut him down at some point. So I love that call. Uh, before we get into the rest of the Week 17 schedule and second half of the NBA, it's just a reminder for all your favorite NBC sports shows, go over to Amazon Music. Uh, you just head to Amazon.com backslash NBC Sports, and it's really that easy, and you'll get to hear more from Raphael and Dan and myself there. Uh, but said Friday, Saturday, big, big, big NBA slate. Or Thursday, Friday, excuse me, big NBA slate. We got 12 games on Thursday, uh, 10 games on Friday. Uh, so, Dan, start us off as always. What are you looking at on the schedule? Can we can we talk about real quick, what is the scheduling? <laughs> what? Right after the All Star break, you give thirteen teams back to back games, like right off the bat. Like, yeah, let's get right back into it, guys. Like, <laughs> and then fourteen teams, I think sixteen teams, sorry, have three games and four nights. 
like fantasy basketball wise, that's great. Cool. We get a lot of games to watch or whatever. But I'm just talking about like the demand on these mm-hmm. players. Like mm-hmm. you just came from Indianapolis. Some people were busy all weekend and then you give them three games and four nights. Like we got that. That's a bigger conversation. But um, outside of that, man, I, I think that you have a, your pick of the litter, to be honest, because there's going to be so many players available for you to pick up. Ayo Desumu, as we already talked about, Keontae George um, in shallow leagues. Marvin Bagley still available for those in shallow leagues. Um, Scoot Henderson is a guy that's still under 50% rostered. So, you know, I, I don't actually don't really have uh, a main guy to pick up, so to speak, because I think that you're just going to have so many options. I would just target those teams that play three games in four nights um, and just know that you're not going to be able to play uh, some of these waiver guys on those bigger slates. So um, I would just target the teams that are playing. Um, let me see here. Let me pull it up again. Um, yeah, definitely want to look at the teams that are playing on Saturday. So that would be Orlando, Detroit, uh, Brooklyn, Minnesota, the Knicks, Boston, um, which probably aren't going to have too many people to pick up. So, yeah, I, I think Detroit interests me. Like you could probably go Simone Fontecchio, Mm-hmm. Um, Marcus Sasser potentially. Jaden Ivy is a guy that's probably too rostered now, but um, yeah, I, I would just stay with the bigger, with the lesser, lesser slate of games, which is really on Saturday. Yeah, Rafael, what's your advice for uh, all the games over the next few days? I think it's a good call. Kind of focused on Saturday. Uh, in terms of the teams that play three times the rest of the week, I look at Charlotte. Um, they play better basketball after the trade deadline for one. I think Trey Mann and uh, and Grant Williams are two guys relatively available in, in a lot of standard leagues. Those are two you're going to yeah. want to look at. Um, I kind of feel like we've got the best out of Nick Richards at this point. Now, we still don't know when or if Mark Williams will return. If you need a big, you can consider Richards. But I think Mann and Grant Williams are the two guys I would say on that, that Hornets roster right now I would strongly consider adding, even though they're, they're three games – are on the three busier days of the remainder of week 17. Yeah, the Hornets are another team, too, that I definitely think will be worth looking at uh, in fantasy. And Grant Williams is intriguing. I mean, he's now uh, bounced around three teams now in over, what, like, last six, seven months. Uh, mm-hmm. So certainly an interesting situation from him who's expecting a lot more after his first four seasons in Boston. But I like this. Could be a situation where he plays really hard down the stretch. It may be nothing more than contract and future earnings. Uh, that Grant Williams is playing for. Uh, anything else worth adding, Dan? Yeah, I would say you can confidently avoid the Miami Heat in their situation. It seemed like Jimmy Butler was doing a lot of ramping up over the All-Star break, so I think he's going to be healthy. Probably puts a damper on someone like Dun- Duncan Robinson, mm-hmm. um, Jaime Hawkes a little bit. But um, also I would avoid the – I think it's the Clipper. No, sorry, the Memphis Grizzlies. They only play one game. So you're not going to really get much streaming appeal um, out of them either. So, yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of options. We talked to a lot of names uh, today. So um, just be active on the waiver wire target that Saturday and and also the, the Charlotte Horns, because I think Trey Mann is another guy that we didn't talk about that also could easily have um, league winning potential if Lamella Ball doesn't return. Yeah, talk about a guy with 20 points out of nowhere, 30 points out of nowhere on any given night. That's Trey Mann in Charlotte. Uh, no matter what the score is, he's going to be taking his shot attempts, uh, given the opportunity. So I like that call, too, for sure. Um, lasting thoughts, Rafael? I'll let you get the last one in if you have anything. No, it's Nothing. good to have actual games back. Um, so, yeah, yes. time to get this thing done. Hopefully we can help some of you managers out there win some money this spring. Yeah. Yes, because that is why you are here. And to do that, Raphael is at NBCSports.com to find all his work on Roto World as well. And for Dan, his work is over at Yahoo Sports. So make sure you guys are checking it out and getting all the information you need outside of just when we film today. I want to say thank everyone for watching. Thank you for the producers in the background also holding us down as always. But the Roto World Basketball Show appreciates you, and we'll see you next week. Fix the slam dunk contest. Make it a block party. <laughs>